before I share here. Okay, so we're running live here. Um, what I want to do initially here is just um, show you the sheet that I posted on Blackboard with the required uh, and recommended textbooks. So blind spots, fundamentals of ethics and understanding media ethics. Those should be easy to find Amazon. Um, there should be plenty of copies available, even e-copies in many cases, which are less expensive than the paper copies. And then this recommended uh, work, the writing philosophy. This is the Vaughn, um, the Vaughn book that I mentioned last time, um, but uh, didn't have on the didn't have on the list. So if you have any questions about uh, about um, the reading list, just let me know. It's this is posted on Blackboard, so you, you have access to it. Uh, let's see. I'm gonna drop that down now, and. Get my PDFs here. So I promised you that I would. Yeah, I promised uh, you that I would give you a bit of a diagram of some of what we covered last time. So when I introduce philosophy to you, given that this is, you know, philosophy course. So remember, we talked about metaphysics. Metaphysics involve these sort of existence type questions that I put here, existence and essence type questions, because you know, we want to think about what exists in a, you know, very general way when we do, um, when we do metaphysics and philosophy. We also want to know the nature of those things that exist. Um, and I gave you three sort of metaphysical topics that are huge in the history of philosophy, you know, God, right, the soul, and, and, and free will. Um, there are a whole host of others, as you can imagine, but that's what metaphysics is about, existence in essence or existence in natures, the natures of the things that exist. And then there's epistemology, just by way of recap, which concerns knowledge, the, the, the study of knowledge, um, the study of theories of knowledge. And then there's ethics, which is really our proper domain. This is a you know, media ethics course. Um, and within ethics, there was you know, value theory. When you think about value theory, you should be thinking about you know, goodness and badness. And then there's normative theory. When you think about normative theory, you should be thinking about rightness and wrongness. And then in applied ethics, well, um, you're thinking about you know, practical um, problems where we try to take some of our you know, ethical theory, ethical principles and the like, ethical frameworks more generally and try to apply them to um, practical problems. And I gave a list of, you know, um, of um, you know, sample uh, practical problems like abortion, a euthanasia, capital punishment, torture, um, pornography, um, when that was related to the media ethics topic. So media ethics is here in green because it's a part of applied ethics. At least that's a common way of understanding media ethics. There is actually some debate about that, but it's commonly accepted that media ethics is part of applied ethics. So again, when we do media ethics, what we're going to be doing is something similar is we're going to try to take, you know, the ethical theory, ethical principles, and we're going to try to use um, them to help us understand and deal with um, problems that arise in um, the media, the arena of media. Um, and then meta ethics, remember, was the metaphysics and epistemology, the semantics of, of ethics. So it's kind of the self reflective part of, of, of ethics that will come up. So, where we ask questions like, are there ethical facts in the first place? So, you might think like you're dealing with a practical problem, media ethics, whether or not pornography is something that's morally permissible. Some might like initially respond by saying, well, there aren't any facts of the matter when it comes to the moral permissibility of, of, of anything, um, let alone whether or not it's morally permissible to, you know, um, to print things like images, pornographic images. So um, metaethics is, is going to be concerned with the metaphysics and epistemology um, of, you know, of ethics. It's a metaphysics and epistemology of ethics. Of course, you might think that there are um, ethical facts, but it's just that we can't know them. So that's another way that one could uh, think about um, the epistemology of ethics. Okay, and then the last uh, topic uh, in philosophy, the last subject matter of philosophy that I discussed um, um, is logic, that is, which just concerns correct reasoning. And we'll talk a bit about that as the course goes on, but it won't be like something that's super emphasized in the class. This is just all by way of review. And again, because I promised to give you this, this diagram, because there was quite a bit that we discussed on this front. Any questions or clarifications needed? 
but I could answer. Okay, so um, if we're good, then keep in mind that kind of where we're at um, in, in the first couple of weeks is going to be um, focusing on um, the theoretical part of ethics, um, getting a, a bit of a base lined up, which will help us then to, um, to do some media ethics. But uh, as I've began to review some of the um, course material, some of the course texts that Prescott ordered online, I do know that, um, that a lot of what we're going to be studying and covering will kind of, it'll introduce ethical theory and ethical principles along the way. Okay. Okay, so let's now turn to uh, trolleyology. Okay, and I, I just basically was able to introduce a couple of uh, trolley cases last time. One actual, you know, the original trolley case and another that's oftentimes presented when doing trolleyology. It was a transplant case. I remember Thompson was someone who, um, um, who I'm following here. It's her paper, The Trolley Problem, that I was using to um, guide me in my introduction of trolleyology. And if you don't know what trolleyology is, remember it's a study of trolley cases, but it's, its main significance for our purposes is that it helps us think about ethical theory, I think in a maybe fun or interesting way, at least initially. Um, uh, Thompson credits Flip a Foot, as you may recall from last time with being the founder of um, trolleyology. She was the granddaughter of the former president, Grover Cleveland. Um, in case you're interested in the, in the work of Flippa Foot, she's known for being an Aristotelian ethicist. So if you're interested in the philosophy of Aristotle or the ethics of Aristotle, her um, recent work, quasi-recent work might be of interest to you. Okay, and you remember the, the trolley case. Let me get at my uh, PDF, got a bunch of them. Um, Okay, so here's the original trolley case, just by way of recap. Um, so T here for trolley, right there you are in the, in the trolley zooming along. There's five uh, trolley track workers and the trolley remember is gonna by default go straight and kill the five track workers, but um, there's a switch inside the trolley which would allow for redirection leftward here to kill the one track worker and you know, all things being equal, it seems like it's morally permissible, if not morally required, morally obligatory for you who here in the trolley to flip the switch, redirect the danger toward the one away from the five. Okay, so that's the original trolley case. Keep in mind that this original trolley case gives some like initial reason for thinking that at least in some cases, it's permissible to redirect danger away from the few, right, towards the many. In this case, the few is the one and the many would be, you know, the five. So if that, if that you know, judgment, that moral judgment is right, when we think about this case, then um, again, there's evidence for such redirections. And then the question becomes, um, when are such redirections uh, permissible and or required as the case may be? So that's the original trolley case, just by way of recap. I got this new mouse here, so I'm kind of still learning it. Okay, some people think that, um, or have argued that, um, that thinking about the uh, original trolley case, it vindicates utilitarianism um, because the right thing to do, see, it's, it seems to be to um, bring about the uh, best overall consequences. Okay, the best overall consequences, um, I think neutrally understood would be to, um, to save the five and kill the one. So there's a net plus four lives saved. If you were to go, um, if you're allowed the trolley to go straight to kill the five, then you'd end up with a minus four lives saved and you just do simple arithmetic there. And I have just utilitarianism noted here. I gave you a kind of slogan way of understanding utilitarianism, something to initially hang your hat on. 
utilitarianism can be understood as you know the, the view promote the happiness of all and promote oftentimes gets defined as maximize so maximize the happiness of all but more precisely the ethical theory claiming that the right action in any situation is the one that on balance promotes that is maximum or, or for example maximizes happiness for all who are affected by the action and all usually gets defined in terms of every sentient being Right, every every being that's capable of experiencing, feeling, or for whom happiness is you know a possibility. Um, but for Thompson and others, they disagree that utilitarianism is vi is vindicated by thinking about the original trolley case. Um, why? Well, because there's a transplant case that challenges just straightforward versions of utilitarianism. Here's the transplant case. So you can see that, okay. So you got the surgeon, the way Thompson says it's the case, imagine you're the surgeon in the case and um, you have five dying patients in your clinic. Here's the entrance and the healthy patient walks in. The surgeon's thinking, if I only had five organs, he doesn't, right? He goes to um, the place in his clinic where they keep the organs um, ready to go, safe and, um, and sterile finds that um, that the organ case is empty. No worries, healthy patient has walked in. So he's thinking to himself, ah, maybe I could find a way of getting HP's organs to save the five dying patients. So suppose it's imminent, like their deaths are imminent. So uh, he needs to save their lives um, soon. If we're to follow with just straightforward, maximize the happiness of all utilitarian view, it looks like what we should do in this case or what surgeons should do in this case is kill the healthy patient in order to save the five dying patients. But that seems to be the wrong result. Like our judgment tells us that the surgeon would do something seriously morally wrong if he kills a healthy patient. And so philosophers like Thompson and others say so much the worse for utilitarianism. So if utilitarianism is like a false theory, then um, we can't use it to explain the moral judgment that we arrive at in thinking about the original trolley case, right? You can, don't want to use a false, a false ethical theory, right, to explain um, a true judgment that we have, okay? You want the theory to be true. We want our theories to be true. So just keep in mind that utilitarianism is a very general theory. Right, it's saying that you know necessarily, or for every you know action, every possible action, even what explains its being morally right or morally permissible is right. It's the fact that it brings about um, the best um, overall consequences, and those are defined in terms of you know, happiness facts, the happiness of all being promoted or otherwise maximized. Okay, so those cases kick things off for uh, trolleyology. We have the trolley problem um, that emerges from thinking about them. The first two cases here, what explains the moral difference between original trolley and transplant? Right, those two cases, it seems that whatever explains the difference is a non-utilitarian ethical principle or claim because the transplant case seems to disprove utilitarianism. Okay, and if you have an ethical theory, ethical framework that has even just um, a non-utilitarian principle in it, the theory is by, by default, not a utilitarian theory. So here's Foote's solution. So remember Foote is you know, the, um, um, the supposed originator of trolleyology, according to Thompson. So what Foote claims is that when we think about original trolley, it's morally permissible to kill the one in order to save the five, because it's better, all things being equal, to kill one than it is to kill five. So the way Foote thinks about the original trolley case, it's it's a case of kill one, kill one versus kill five. And in these kinds of cases, it's, it's permissible to, to kill one over killing five, all things being equal. But then in transplant, it's morally impermissible to kill the one or save the five because it's better, right? It's better to let five die than it is to kill one. 
And so Foote's going to appeal to this important moral difference, she thinks, between killing and letting die. So a very natural thing to think when thinking about the transplant case. At least many of my students um, have thought so. So in the transplant case, you're either going to let the five dying patients, right? You're just going to let them die if you're the, supposed to, you're the surgeon if you don't kill the healthy patient. Um, but then the other option is to kill the healthy patient to get the organs, harvest the organs, and perform the surgeries on the dying patients. So, um, so the, the, this this killing versus letting die principle is significant. So it's 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 worse to kill than it is to let die. And then when you apply that to the transplant case, it is it's worse to kill one than it is to let five die. And hopefully you see that how that that, that would be a non-utilitarian principle, right? Because on balance, you end up with negative four lives saved. But still, according to the killing versus letting die principle, if we were to use it in the transplant case, right? We should, we should aim for that outcome. The outcome where there's you know, negative four lives saved. Okay, so that's Foote's solution to the problem. <clears throat> but Thompson disagrees. She thinks that Foote's solution fails. And so here she gives us a new case. So we'll call this the bystander case. Why? Because it involves a bystander, surprise, surprise. Let me see what this question is real quick, class. Or if it's a question, maybe it's a comment. No, no, Foot's, Foot's not a utilitarian, right? Foot is, Foot is saying, here's a non-utilitarian principle. Um, the non-utilitarian principle is, um, is a killing versus letting die principle. And according to it, in the transplant case, we should aim for um, minus four lives being saved, right? So we, we, um, we can't kill the healthy patient in order to save the five dying patients because it's it's um it's better to it's better to um or sorry it's worse to kill than it is to um to let die on her view so it's the exact opposite anna okay so um keep in mind this is the bystander case is a case developed by thompson to challenge uh, flip a foot her solution her attempted solution to the trolley problem. And remember the trolley problem is um, understood at least initially in terms of a question. What explains like the moral difference between the original trolley case and the transplant case? And Foote says, oh, I'll tell you the difference. It has to do with this principle involving killing and letting die. Killing is morally worse than letting die. <clears throat> and Thompson's is gonna say, it doesn't work. And how does she show us it doesn't work? Well, she, she shows us that that explanation doesn't work or that principle doesn't work by thinking about the bystander case. So big picture, before we even get into the details here, the, the point of the bystander case is to show that the killing versus letting die principle right, isn't going to solve the trolley problem. So here we have another trolley case. So here you are in the trolley, the trolley zooming along. It's going to default direction is going to go right straight ahead and kill the five track workers unless this switch is this switch right here and the trolley is flipped if that gets flipped then um, the trolley will, will be redirected toward the one track worker and the one track worker will be killed but what happens in bystander is that the person in the trolley faints psychological pressure, duress. I mean, imagine these circumstances, right? Where it looks like you've got to kill. Case seems set up, right? So that way you're forced to kill. So um, you're forced to kill and um, you have to do, um, you have to deal in your conscience perhaps with, you know, um, the sixth commandment. Um, but anyways, no worries, according to the bystander case, there's a bystander who sees everything unfolding. And fortunately, there's a switch, so S for switch here, that he has easy access to that's reliable. And so bystander um, sizes what's, size up what's going on here. And on Thompson's view, well, he has to make a decision, right? So the switch represents making a decision. 
And on Thompson's view, it is permissible, if not required, for a bystander to flip the switch, to redirect the trolley uh, toward the one. And so um, what Thompson concludes is that, is that if bystander were to do nothing in the case, then he would be letting the five die, the five track workers die. Yeah, but given that it's morally permissible at the very least, if not morally required for the bystander to flip the switch to kill the one, then here's a counter example to the killing versus letting die principle, right? Thompson can say, look, in this case, it's better to kill one than it is to let five die. So she, she thinks that by building in a bystander, she can set up the killing versus letting die distinction in the case to test whether or not that principle holds right, in the general way that foot claims it holds. So you may not agree with Thompson's verdict in the case, but this is the direction that she goes and she says, look, bystander has the option of killing one or letting five die. It's permissible for him to kill the one. So, so much the worse than for the killing versus letting die principle, so long, that, so long as that moral judgment is, is sound. And one thing that Thompson is going to claim here is it doesn't seem like there's any moral difference between this case and the original trolley case. So if in the original trolley case, you're allowed to flip the switch, then so, are, so is bystander in this case. Okay. So again, big picture. What Foot is going to claim is it's better it's it's um, it's better to let five die than it is to kill one, and that explains why it's it's wrong to kill the healthy patient in in um, the transplant case. Thompson says, let's test that principle. This is the test. The, the overwhelming moral judgment she thinks that we're to derive from this case is that it's in this case better to kill one than it is to let five die. You see how those two contradict. So Thompson says we can do away with the uh, foot solution. It doesn't work. Whatever is the case, we, 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 want, um, we want true principles, right? We don't, right? If a principle is false, we can't use it to, um, to explain moral verdicts in cases. So that's Thompson's strategy. And it may turn out that like someone could respond by saying we just need to make more precise the killing versus letting die principle qualify in various ways, but that's not Thompson's job. Thompson's job is to, is to deal with the principles that have been put forward, put forward as uh, potential solutions to um, the trolley problem. Okay, so that's the, um, Thompson's reply to the foot um, claim, the, the attempted her attempted solution. Uh, then there's the Kantian solution that Thompson wants to deal with. So you may know um, Kantianism through the philosopher, the German philosopher, Immanuel Kant. He was an 18th century German philosopher who did a philosophy in all of his major subdisciplines, but he's, he's, he's well known also for his work in ethics. And um, there's an ethical view that's named after him, the Kantian ethical view, Kantian ethical system. Okay, so um, he's been influential in the history of ethics for, um, for that reason, um, for developing kind of a framework for thinking about how to do ethics in the first place. And um, a foundation of Kant's ethics is trying to, um, to put uh, as much as he possibly could, common sense ethics, whatever that means, put it in, uh, put it on firm philosophical footing or provide for philosophical foundations, secure philosophical foundations for our common sense moral thinking. Whether or not he succeeded in doing so has been very questionable. But um, anyways, the, the relevant principle um, that uh, Thompson considers is what's known as a formula of humanity, which no doubt will uh, be discussed uh, throughout this course. It's a very famous ethical principle developed by Kant. Um, and Kant, even in many, in, in some places in his works, in his ethical work, says um, the form of humanity might be the simplest of the principles he developed in terms of applying them um, to our, you know, ordinary moral circumstances. 
So here's the formula of humanity, and it might not make a ton of sense to you unless you've taken some ethical theory where you studied some Kant. So let's see if we can understand the principle. So here's the principle. Here's how I like to formulate it necessarily. So this just means that in every, in every situation, and stronger than that even, in every possible situation, um, it is morally wrong to treat humanity, human beings, as a mere means to one's ends. And it's morally required that we treat humanity as an end in itself. So I don't expect that to make perfect sense. I expect some of what's written here to make sense, but not some of the technical jargon. That's part of the formula, but I'll try to make it clear now. But keep in mind, I, want, I, I intend for this necessarily to, what, to have what we call wide scope. So um, that necessarily applies to the first part and to the second part. So we have a disjunctive claim, or sorry, a conjunctive claim here, meaning we have an and connecting two sentences. So that necessarily applies to both. All right, so you, you can think about it like this, it distributes over both. Um, so, um, so it's morally wrong to treat humanity as a mere means to one's ends. Okay, so what this means is that you can't use or you can't treat human beings as if they're mere tools for your purposes. That's one way of understanding it. Um, the paradigmatic case here, if, it, if, if an example would be helpful, would be to enslave somebody, where you're using someone, you know, just to grow your crops and to expand your assets and resources and the like. Okay, so um, if it's helpful to have that example in mind, um, go ahead and think about that kind of case. It's morally wrong to treat humanity as a mere means to one's ends. Now, keep in mind this: this mere isn't a throwaway. Mere means only for some such, because um, you can treat human beings as means to your ends just not as mere means, as if they were mere tools for your purposes. So, you know, you could go to Starbucks and, and use the uh, barista to get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever, whatever you're getting there. Um, that's totally fine. Like ordinary human interactions involve some degree of, of using um, each other. It's just not, it's not merely using others. So you treat them as if all they are, right, is, sort of that transaction or um, 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 that instrument or tool in order to get what, you're, get what you want to achieve your goals. So when you think about ends here, thinking about like goals. So um, it's more than one treat humanity as a mere means to one's goals or as a means to attaining what one desires or some such would, would fit in here as well. These are just technical terms that Kant uses that can be um, overly unnecessary, but um, I'm trying to give you this, the, the sense of the formula, even as Thompson discusses it in her paper. Now, the second part, and it's morally required, so it's morally obligatory, um, that we treat humanity as an end in itself. So we treat humanity as an end in itself. And a couple of different ways of understanding what it means to treat a human being as an end in itself. You treat humanity as a goal in and of, its, uh, in, in and of itself. Um, that may not be too helpful though, but um, an end in itself for Kant is something that has significant value. Um, so I think this might be the most helpful way of understanding it is, is an end in itself is a, is a being that has a kind of um, absolute or um, an intrinsic worth that, um, uh, that's priceless. So Kant, um, he famously says that, you know, human beings have a kind of pricelessness, a kind of infinite or absolute value as evidenced by the fact that there's no price you can assign to human life. Now, of course, historically we've tried to do that, but we were wrong in doing so. There's no true price. There's no price that we can assign to human life. Okay, to the value of the human life. There's a sense in which it's priceless. That's what an end in itself is. So we're always required to treat other human beings as if they have this very significant value is very significant worth. They're not just mere instruments. They don't have mere finite value as, as, as things have, right? as inanimate objects have, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So that's a whole lot of words for the form of humanity. I'm trying to give you the, the gist of it. But now think about this principle and how it might be applied in resolving the, the trolley problem. So you go to the transplant case and you think about the the surgeon, right? The surgeon would be using the healthy patient as a mere means, right? 
to his goal of saving the dying patients, remember? So some could invoke the formula of humanity in order to try to solve the trolley problem. So that's why we're talking about this Kantian principle. That's why Thompson discusses it because it's a prominent principle and some have used it to try to resolve the trolley problem. Okay. So thus, one does not violate the formula of humanity uh, merely by killing the one in order to save the five in the original trolley case. Because in that case, you're not, um, at least according to those who adhere to the formula of humanity, you're not using the one as a mere means to your ends. Okay. So, um, so killing someone doesn't automatically involve treating someone as a mere means for one's ends, right? Kant argued. And so Thompson just follows suit with that. She goes ahead and grants that. But then we think about two, but the surgeon violates the formula of humanity by killing HP in order to save the, the DPs in the, in, in the transplant case. The surgeon violates the formula of humanity by killing the healthy patient in order to save the dying patients in transplant. So crucially, you knows that you know, Thompson doesn't really take any truck with number one here. She goes ahead and she, she assumes it. And then she says, okay, this is going to be the crucial thing that she wants to focus on is this point. Is that those who want to resolve the trolley problem are going to say that, look, the formula of humanity explains the wrongness of surgeon killing the healthy patient in order to save the dying, uh, in order to in order to save the, the dying patients. Any questions or concerns or clarifications needed about that? Okay, so that may sound pretty good, you know, at least initially. I mean, insofar as you were understanding, you know, Kant's principle here. But Thompson doesn't think it works. So what Thompson does is she builds on the bystander case in order to test the formula of humanity. So remember, with the bystander case, she tests the principle, the, the killing versus letting die principle. So what she's going to do is she's going to add to bystander in order to test whether or not the formula of humanity right, is generally true. And if it's not, then we can't use it to explain or to answer or to deal with the trolley problem because we're gonna, we, need a, we need a true principle, not a false one. And so we scroll down. The loop, the loop case. And I say she just adds to bystander here. So everything is the same, except for a few different, except for a few things. Okay, so um, two, I guess two main things. So we have bystander right next to a switch. We have um, you and the trolley who faints. The, the trolley is gonna by default kill the five unless this unless this switch is flipped. Well, why is it called the loop case? Because what she does is she adds this looping. She adds extra track here, basically, in the case. She adds this extra track here. And she adds mass here. So when we go to the bystander case, um, we have, you might just say, just a smaller person in terms of their mass here. So here she adds mass, quite a bit of mass, enough mass to guess what? Uh, stop the trolley, okay? So why do I write PF here? Because I just give a name to this individual, a bit anachronistic based on the, um, the flow of Thompson's paper. But I named this individual portly fella. You know, portly meaning like big, husky, large, and he's a fellow. Some people hear me when I say, hear, hear me call him poorly fellow, they hear poorly fella. Well, he might be a poorly fella here too, given that he happens to be here, but he's portly, he's large. So there's two main differences, isn't there? There's the addition of the track and then there's mass added. Enough mass as it were to stop the trolley. So we can assume that if the trolley just goes by default, so the bystander does nothing, then what's gonna happen is the trolley is gonna smash through the five, or come back around and 
perhaps kill the poorly fella. But if the switch is if the switch is flipped, bystander throws the switch, then the trolley will be redirected to the poorly fella, which will then stop the trolley, prevent it from killing the five. And this must be one husky guy, let's just say. Originally, he was called the fat man. Okay, I'm trying to be a bit more PC in my labeling here, but he was called the fat man. It may interest you. There's a book out there called um, "Would You Call the uh, Would You Kill the Fat Man." Um, David Edmonds, um, he's the author of the book. It's a book on trolleyology, basically. That's a title that he uses uh, for the book. Okay, so um, Thompson, she would call this individual the fat man later. Um, Again, this is a bit anachronistic. She just said, this is just a really, really large man over here. And then later we get this character in her paper called, um, called the fat man, who I'm, who I'm calling the portly fella. So basically what I do is I just say, there's a cameo appearance here in the loop case of the portly fella, okay? All right, so what's going on in this case? Thompson wants to claim that adding mass here adding track here doesn't produce, right, on their own, anything that would right, render a different moral verdict for bystander. So bystander is still within his moral rights or still permissible for bystander to flip the switch, okay? May even be required to do so, okay? because there's no moral difference between the loop case and the bystander case. So if in the bystander case, bystander can flip the switch or even is, a, is obligated to do so, then the same thing is true in the loop case. Because adding track and adding mass and the locations where they were added doesn't, doesn't amount to a moral difference between the cases. But now note how this is a challenge to the formula of humanity, at least according to Thompson, by flipping the switch, we have to target the mass right, of the portly fella. We have to target something very specific, specific about him, that he has the mass that he has. And so in flipping the switch to save the five killing the portly fella, we're using the portly fella as a mere means, as a mere tool for our goal of saving the five. Upshot, Kant's formula of humanity is false. Because remember, it's a, supposed to hold, the formula of humanity is supposed to hold in every possible case. But here's a possible case in which it doesn't. So the principle is false. It's, this is a counterexample of the formula of humanity, according to Thompson. And so we can't appeal to it in order to resolve the trolley problem. It's permissible to kill PF, the portly fella, in the loop case. So Kant's form of humanity isn't true. It can't be then used to explain the world difference between original trolley and transplant. In other words, we're not able to solve the trolley problem using Kant's form of humanity. As you can guess, Kantians, those who endorse the form of humanity, like they respond to Thompson on this, but at least that's her take. Okay. Okay, so you know, trolleyology, as I've noted, to help us think about and or evaluate ethical moral principles and theories. Here are three theories principles we've learned about today. Um, and even last time we talked about utilitarianism. Utilitarianism, promote the happiness of all. Killing is worse than letting die. That principle, killing is morally worse than letting die. And then the formula of humanity, right? Necessarily, right, it's morally wrong to treat humanity as a mere means. It's morally required necessarily that we treat humanity as an end in itself. We treat humanity as if it has this absolute priceless worth. Thompson claims that utilitarianism fails. Think about the transplant case. Thompson argues that the clear versus that die principle fails in its generality. Think about the um, bystander case. And Thompson argues that the form of humanity fails. Think about the loop case. So if those are false, then they can't be used to solve the trolley problem. 
This is the original formulation of the trolley problem. What explains the moral difference between original trolley and transplant? These are the trolley cases that we've looked at so far. Original trolley, transplant, bystander, and loop. Thompson calls the bystander case the bystander at the switch case. I just shorten it. We've already talked about these principles. So we've got, we got a, a, a little over, uh, right around 10 minutes left. So let's go ahead and talk about Thompson's solution. You might want to know what it is. Um, so when, when Thompson uh, offers her solution to the trolley problem, she reformulates it in a certain way. She focuses on the difference between bystander and transplant instead of original trolley and transplant. So she wants to know what explains the difference between bystander and transplant in her solution to the trolley problem. So the trolley problem question becomes, what explains the moral difference between bystander uh, and transplant? Like what makes it okay in bystander to kill the one? That makes sense, remember the bystander case, she claims it's permissible and uh, if not required, morally required to kill the one in it. But in transplant, remember the surgeon can't kill the healthy patient in order to save the five. So what's the moral difference between them? She could have talked about the difference between the original trolley and transplant, but she just, for whatever reason, focuses on the difference between bystander and transplant. But remember, she thought there was no moral difference between original trolley and bystander in the first place. So it's no problem beginning with bystander. So I don't think there's anything sneaky going on here in the Thompson. Okay, so Thompson tells us that the solution to the trolley problem actually rests on the concept of a right. It rests on thinking about right, a person's rights. And rights will be relevant to this class. So um, as, as will utilitarianism, as, as will the formula of humanity. So introducing the concept of, of right or this moral notion of, of a right is, is, is important. So we're laying some, um, laying some foundation here. So you might be asking just like initially, what's a right? You probably have an intuitive sense of what one is, but we'll talk more about it. But the initial thing maybe to say about what a right is, it's, it's a claim. It's, 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 or it's that which allows, uh, provides someone with a claim, um, a claim to be benefited or a claim against others to not be interfered with. So um, we tend to think that there are negative rights and positive rights, rights not to be interfered with, then rights to be benefited respectively. So a negative right is a right not to be interfered with. And a positive right would be the right to be benefited. Okay. And typically corresponding to um, rights are corresponding um, obligations or duties. So if, um, if, if someone has um, the right not to be killed, suppose you have the right not to be killed, then um, which I think you do have, then I have a duty to refrain from killing you and vice versa, okay? Um, if a child has the right to um, be given an education, then, um, then the child's parents have a duty to provide that education benefit. Just to give you very simple examples of how um, uh, rights and obligations or rights and duties seem to be intimately connected in this way and give examples of um, um, negative rights, positive rights, but then corresponding to them will be negative duties and positive duties. So if you have, um, if I have a, a duty um, or an example of just a negative duty would be the duty not to interfere with you, the duty not to kill you in the example given, and then a positive duty would be the duty to positively benefit you in some way. So that's just, just a very, um, very introductory way of thinking about rights. I'm sure you have an intuitive sense of what rights are. Let's get to Thompson's solution. Um, so let's go to the Thompson paper, for, uh, page 1403. Okay. So she writes, suppose the bystander at the switch proceeds 
He throws the switch, thereby turning the trolley onto the right-hand track, thereby causing the one to be hit by the trolley, thereby killing him, saving the five on the straight track. There are two facts about what he does, which seem to me to explain the moral difference between what he does and what the agent in transplant would be doing if he proceeded, what surgeon would be doing if he proceeded on killing right, the healthy patient. In the first place, the bystander saves his five by making something that threatens them instead threaten one. Okay. So um, what happens in the bystander case is danger is redirected away from the five right toward the one. Second, the bystander does not do that by means which themselves constitute an infringement of any right of the ones. In other words, in the bystander case, when the bystander flips the switch, by flipping the switch, redirecting the danger away from the many toward the one, what the bystander does doesn't constitute in itself an infringement of any right um, to the one. Okay. Like the, in other words, the, the flipping of the switch to redirect the trolley toward the one track worker does not itself constitute a violation of the rights of the one. Now it's gonna be true on Thompson's view that the one does have his right to life violated, but in the case, all things being equal, it's permissible to violate that right. So the crucial thing for Thompson is gonna be when we think about redirecting, dan redirecting danger away from the many towards the one or toward the few, um, the crucial thing is the means that we take. And we have to ask ourselves whether or not the means themselves constitute an infringement of the rights right, to, of the few. Okay, and if they don't, if those means don't constitute an infringement of the rights of the few, then it can be permissible to redirect the danger toward the uh, few away from the many. That's sort of the nutshell of her solution. So keep in mind, remember, the, and I tried to anticipate this earlier, keep in mind that for Thompson, the original trolley case shows that it's permissible in some cases to redirect danger away from the many toward the few. The question is, is in what circumstances is it okay? Or what's gonna explain um, when it's okay, at least across a range of cases that are acceptable? And she's given us an answer here. It's when the means taken to redirect the danger away from the many toward the few doesn't involve an infringement of the rights of the few, it can be permissible, morally permissible, and or obligatory uh, to do so. So that's the 1403 passage. So danger, we think about the bystander case now, if danger is directed toward the five, bystander can direct the danger toward the one. So now I'm just talking now about not the original trolley case, but back to the bystander, which remember there's no moral difference uh, for Thompson between um, the original trolley case and bystander case. And so bystander can, can do so. He can, he can redirect the danger away from the many toward the few, away from the, away from the five toward the one by means that themselves do not constitute an infringement uh, on the rights of ones or of the one. This is just Thompson's language here. Okay, which is not maybe not how we would put it, but that's how she puts it. Um, good, you go to the transplant case. Because remember, we're trying to figure out what's the moral difference between, um, between the bystander case and the transplant case. Why can we, in the bystander case, redirect danger away from the many towards the few, but we can't do so in the transplant case? So in the transplant case, it doesn't seem like we can redirect danger away from the many to the few. The way in which we would redirect, range away, redirect danger away from the many to the few in the transplant case would be by doing what? Killing and harvesting the, or, the organs from the healthy patient and getting them and then performing the surgeries on the, on the dying patients. So we're surgeon to direct danger, redirect danger to the healthy patient in order to free the dying patients of danger, he would have to do so through means that constitute an infringement of the rights of healthy patients. Presumably, harvesting healthy patients' organs against his will constitutes an infringement of his rights. Right? You go to, you go, now you go, you go back to the bystander case. There's the bystander. Merely flipping a switch to redirect a trolley toward the one, when we describe it that way, 
itself doesn't constitute an infringement on the one track workers' rights, at least according to Thompson, okay? I'm gonna put in re here before I forget. Okay, so um, back to the bystander case then. Bystander simply needs to turn the trolley onto the tracks on which the one is situated, as already anticipated, in order to redirect danger, redirect danger from the five to the one. And in doing this, again, all by itself does not constitute an infringement on the rights of ones. Transplant case, surgeon needs to operate on an unwilling patient to harvest his organs, remember, in order to redirect danger from the five to the one in that case, or from the many to the few. The means that surgeon needs to take to redirect danger from the dying patients to the healthy patient do constitute an infringement of healthy patients' rights. That seems like sound common sense. And then Thompson says, okay, let me give you an independent case here. Give you the case of the footbridge is a very famous case. So it's original, it's a trolley case. There's a trolley zooming along five um, um, track workers, you know, tied up. So there's a little bit difference in the presentation of the case here. You don't have to imagine them tied up, but this is the image that I found online that I thought would be serviceable. And now imagine that there, here's poorly fella, they call him the fat man on a footbridge. And there you are, you can save the five by just chucking him off, shoving him, right? He's gonna fall right here. And he's so large that he'll be able to stop the momentum of the trolley. If you were to do so, Thompson claims that it'd be morally wrong for you to do that in this case because the means taken to save the five, to redirect the danger away from the five to the one involve intrinsically an infringement on the rights of the one here, the, the portly fella. Why? Because shoving him off a footbridge violates his rights. So it's a kind of like independent trolley case to show um, uh, Thompson's solution holds. There he is, he's, or here, here's the case, uh, another image I found where you've got this bystander type figure, right? Instead of you know having the shoving, right? Ends up um, pushing a, flipping a switch over here, which then knocks and topples it, pours the fell onto the tracks to this um, stop the momentum of the trolley to save the five. Okay. Okay, good. So um, the rest here, um, Right, um, Thompson solution, big picture. I'll just, I'll just um, conclude with this. The correct explanation, thinking about the trolley problem, uh, involves thinking about rights, morally permits redirecting burdens, dangers, catastrophes away from the many towards the few. In the cases where such redirections are morally permissible, is grounded in or sufficiently explained by um, the means taken in such redirections. If the means to such redirections involve no constitutive rights violations to the few towards whom the burdens, dangers, catastrophes are directed, then such redirections can be morally permissible. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll post these slides so you have access um, to them um, when you're doing your studying, but that, uh, that'll conclude today's discussion. Let me see what this chat question has. Um, I've gone over, so if you, need to, if you need to go, that's totally fine. Let me see what these chat questions or comments are. We'll go from there, but um, the rest of you, if you're going to take off, I'll see you all next week. Have a great weekend and be in touch as needed. Thanks for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good one. I'll go ahead and uh, stop sharing real quick. All right, have a good one, everybody. I'm going to check the chat after I stop recording here.